welcome to biology my passion i am saumya harikrishna we are learning the chapter sexual reproduction in flowering plants and we finished a microsporogenesis and a megasporogenesis today we will come to the next step in pre fertilization events pre fertilization events include gametogenesis and gamete transfer so gametogenesis is over now we are talking about gamete transfer in plants the gamete transfer is through the process called pollination so what is pollination Pollination is the transfer of pollen grains from the anther because they are forming within the anther to the stigma of a flower. Stigma is the part of the pistil which is a part of gynecia, right? So that is female reproductive part. So the transferring process is called a pollination. So depending on how it is transferred from flower to flower or within the flower or plant to plant, there are three types of pollination. They are named as autogamy, gametogamy, and xenogamy. So let us see one by one. This diagram will tell you what is each one. Autogamy. Auto means what? Self. So, if the pollen grain of a flower falls on the stigma of the same flower, then it is called a autogamy or it is strictly self-pollination. And here, which plant can have this? Only bisexual flowers, right? Because if it is unisexual flowers, this is not possible. Only bisexual flowers can carry on autogamy. Whereas, gametogamy is a condition where the pollen transfer occurs between two flowers but of the same plant. That is from one flower to the other. So, if it is having bisexual flower also it is possible. Otherwise, if it is unisexual flowers but both the unisexual flowers should be in the same plant. What do you call such plants? Both the unisexual flowers are in the same monoecious plants, right? So, if it is dioecious, means male plant is different, female plant is different, gametogamy is not possible. Now, the third is called a xenogamy. Xenogamy means what? The pollen transfer occurs between two different plants, flowers of two different plants belonging to the same species. So, here, which plant can have this? If it is uh, dioecious also, this can happen, right? Uh, so, in these cases, we can say that this is strictly self-pollination, but this is strictly cross-pollination we know. But what about this? So, here we can say it is functionally cross-pollination because it is happening between two different flowers, but genetically it is self-pollination because the same genome, gene will be or the genome will be there in both the uh, pollen grain as well as the uh, female gamete, right? So, it is a functionally cross pollination but genetically self pollination for pollination to happen sometimes agents may be required for the transfer of pollen it's a uh, necessary for cross pollination especially xenogamy so which are the agents usually carry out pollination we have two types of pollinating agents biotic or abiotic biotic means the living organisms carrying out the purpose of pollination abiotic means non-living among this biotic is most common and since it is carried out by different types of animals we can collectively call it as zoophily uh, depending upon which animal is doing this there are different names that we are giving if it is by insects we call it as entomophily and if birds are doing it it is called a ornithophily if bats are doing it is called a chiropterophily Snails, it is called a malacophily and pollination by ants is called a myrmicophily. When we come to abiotic factors, basically wind and water are the two abiotic agents bringing about pollination. Among these two, wind is most common. Especially all grass plants or cereal varieties, uh, it is basically animophily or the wind pollination. So don't confuse, animophily is not animal pollination, animal pollination is zoophily. Okay, animophily and hydrophily. In hydrophily, it can be again two types. Uh, which plants will be doing hydrophily? Your immediate answer would be aquatic plants. Suppose I tell about lotus, water lily, etc. Do they have hydrophily? Absolutely not. Don't think that all aquatic plants are doing hydrophily. No, because if you see the flowers of lotus and all, it's very attractive. It can attract insects for pollination and the flower is above the water level. So, all aquatic plants are not carrying out hydrophily. There are certain plants adapted to do it. Those plants are of two types, epihydrophily and hypohydrophily. Epi means above, hypo means below. So, if the pollen transfer or pollination happens, 
above the water level that is called epihydrophily. For example, the case of Vallisneria, we will study. The same way, if it is happening within the water surface or underwater, it is called a hypohydrophily. For example, Zostera or seagrass. Among biotic pollinating agents, insects are the most common type and the pollination through insects is called a entomophily and the flowers which are pollinated by insects are called a entomophilous flowers. So in among uh, insects again bees are the most common pollinators. So these flowers should have certain characteristics to attract the pollinating agent so that their pollen grades can be transferred. First of all these flowers are brightly colored and they have very beautiful floral parts. So any flower if you see it's very bright and if colored you can easily say that it is entomophilus or it is pollinated by the agency of insects. Then there will be presence of nectar because these pollinating agents are visiting the flower for their need only. So to sustain the visit or attract them back again and again they have to visit. So for that the plants are offering the gift or the, as a return gift like pollen and some nectar. So that for getting that these insects will be visiting again. So whenever they are collecting these pressures from the flowers, the pollen grains will fall on their body and once they go to the next flower and collect the same nectar or pollen from that, these pollens will fall there also. This is how pollination is happening. Not only the small insects but some large animals also carry out pollination. But there are certain uh, flowers with the foul smell also. They are actually pollinated by flies or beetles because they are attracted by the foul smell. You know where is fly actually preferring? That is all the uh, dirty places, right? Whereas usually the other flowers will have a beautiful fragrance because to attract the pollinating agent. Then if the flowers are small, in all flower, uh, plants the flower may not be big. So if the flowers are small, they will arrange together in the form of inflorescence to attract the pollinating agents. In some plants and insects, there is actually an obligatory relationship and that means a particular flower can be pollinated by a particular insect only. Uh, apart from giving only the nectar and pollen for eating, they sometimes provide a shelter or a place for laying eggs. That's called the OV position. The tallest flower of Amorpha phallus, which is almost 6 feet long, it can provide space for the insects to lay their eggs safely. The same way there is an association between the yucca plant and the moth, pollinating moth. The moth is searching for a place to lay eggs. So inside the ovary there is space called a locule. That space is given to the moth for laying its eggs. At the same time while laying the eggs the moth is taking the pollen grain from it and it is taking it to the next plant. So it is actually an obligatory relationship. Without the moth, the yucca plant cannot get pollinated. Without yucca plant, moth also will not be able to continue its generation. Nocturnal flowers means what? Blooming at night. These flowers usually have very pungent smell or very sweet fragrance and also they will be white in color in order to attract the insects for pollination. Characteristics of wind pollinated flowers are anemophilous flowers. First of all, the pollen grains are light and non-sticky so that they can be easily carried by the wind current. Then anthers are well exposed so that the wind is taking the pollen grain. Feathery stigma. Stigma is also feathery so that they can trap the pollen grain coming through the wind. Flowers need not be colorful. They need not have fragrance so colorless and orderless flowers. Here mostly flowers are very small and they form pack of flowers called the inflorescence. Then numerous flowers are there in the inflorescence but each flower will have a single ovule in its ovary. So these are the characteristics of anemophilous flowers. Concorp or tassel represents the style and stigma. Uh, it is a wind pollinated plant. So wind pollination is mainly happening in grass plants. Now there are two different types of flowers. Chasmogamous flowers that is the flowers which are open so that their anther and stigma all are exposed. So cross-pollination can happen or self-pollination can happen whereas the second type is called a cleistogamous flowers where the, the flower is always closed, they never open so that there is no chance of cross-pollination at all. Since it is not opening, another pollen cannot fall on the stigma so only self-pollination can happen in these flowers. Typical examples are Viola, Comelina and Oxalis. But there is one more advantage here that is uh, even if there is no agent, 
self pollination will definitely happen and also that will lead to production of seeds that is assured seeds that is the characteristics of cleistogamous flowers hydrophily or water pollination so water pollination is not a very popular means of pollination among plants even the hydrophytic plants need not carry out the hydrophily like water hyacinth lotus or water lily all those have a insect pollination so mainly uh, only 30 genera genus pluralis genera 30 genera of plants have hydrophily Hydrilla and Gallicinaria are freshwater plants which carry out hydrophily whereas seagrass or sostira is a marine variety which carries out hydrophily. So we will see how is hydrophily happening in Gallicinaria. It is epihydrophily means above the water level. So in this case what happens is the uh, water flower is almost reaching to the top. The so female flower is exposed outside though it is attached to the bottom of the water body. Uh, the female flower reaches the top and male flower also releases pollen grains on the surface of water. So the pollen grains will come to this flower by passive water currents or when ripples are forming in water in that the pollen grains eventually reach the stigma of the flower. So why are plants not preferring this? Because the chance is very less, right? The same way if you see Zostira, it is hypohydrophilic, that is under the water. Here the male flowers and female flowers are there. The pollen grains are released into the water. The pollen grains will swim through the water current or passively, not swimming, passively it will be coming through uh, the water current and reaching the female flower or female part and uh, pollinate it. So what is the characteristic of pollen grain in such plants? They are long and ribbon shaped so that they can be easily carried by the water currents and also they have mucilaginous covering. Mucilaginous means what mucus layer which is very uh, viscous so that it can prevent wetting of the pollen grains. So flowering plants can have self pollination or cross pollination but which is better. Preferably cross pollination is done by plants. The reason being cross pollination will bring in more variations. Variations means better adaptation to the changing environment. So possibility of evolution is also there. Whereas continuous self pollination will lead to a problem called an inbreeding depression. So plants have different methods or strategies to discourage self pollination and to encourage cross pollination. So what are they? Uh, these technical terms are required only for neat aspirants, whereas others just have to learn only what is it. So first is a diclining, means the production of unisexual flowers. So if there is uh, only unisexual flowers, how can self-pollination be possible? It's not possible, right? So that is the first method. Second, dichogamy means the anthers are maturing and they dehyze and release the pollen grains and the pollens will fall on the stigma. But stigma also has got some receptivity time. So these two should be synchronized. That is anther, uh, pollen release from the anther and stigma receptivity. So sometimes the anther will mature first but pollen is still not coming. So that condition is called a protogynous condition. Gynesium is ready first. Whereas sometimes the anther will release pollen but gynesium is not receptive. So that is called a protandrous means andresium is ready first. Okay. So if there is no synchronization between the pollen release and the stigma receptivity also uh, self-pollination cannot happen. So that plants can discourage self-pollination and encourage cross-pollination. The third is hercogamy means if even if it is a bisexual flower if the uh, position of the stigma and the anther are at different levels chance of pollen falling on the stigma is less. So that is another way of preventing self pollination and the last is called a self incompatibility. Self incompatibility means it is a genetic mechanism by which the flowers will try to discourage self pollination means uh, the same flowers uh, same pollen grain falls then it will not be allowed to grow through the stigma okay so this is called a what a self incompatibility which is a genetic mechanism of preventing the self pollen from germinating on the stigma so these are the different ways of our outbreeding devices it's a very important question it can come for three marks at least three points you will have to write we discussed the pollination happening naturally but when we want to improve the varieties or cross breeding programs we need to do artificial pollination also that is called a artificial hybridization in such cases we select the parents with the desired quality or the superior varieties as and one will be taken as the male parent other as the female parent 
So first of all we have to do is, if it is a bisexual flower, it will have both stamen and a pistil. So before the stamens are mature, means anther is mature to release the pollen grain, using a forceps we will remove or pull out all the stamens from it, so that only the female part will remain in that flower. That process is called a emasculation. Which flower does not require emasculation? Unisexual. If it is already a female unisexual flower, emasculation is not required, right? But after emasculation, if you leave it open, any unwanted pollen can also fall on it. So to avoid that, we have to bag it. You can use a polythene cover or a paper bag or a butter paper cover to cover the emasculated flower so that still the stigma become receptive. There is no other pollen falling on it or undesirable pollen falling on it. Then we slowly remove the cover out and we take the pollen uh, from the desired variety and dust it on the stigma once it is receptive. After dusting again we have to cover because uh, otherwise unwanted pollen can again fall right but during that time we do a process of tagging also. Tagging is used for uh, writing all the details the name of the breeder the varieties used the date everything will be written on the tag and it also will be attached to the bag. Then rebag it. We have to cover it again so that no unwanted pollen will fall on it. Hope you understood all the portions covered today. If you like my videos, please like, share and subscribe to my channel Biology My Passion. Thank you for watching.